Welcome, welcome all, and thank you for returning. We're up to season two of the Late Bloomer Actor podcast. I'm so uh, so excited to start this season off with a very special guest, Mr. Jeff, Jeff Seymour, aka the real life actor. If you have paid uh, close attention to my um, act, Late Bloomer Actor logo, you would have noticed that the book primary book I'm holding is the real life actor book. So it's just awesome to now have him on the show. Uh, Jeff, welcome and thank you so much for coming on board, mate. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. A bit different to being on the other side because I know you run your own podcast, which we'll talk about, but um, yes, being a guest. Yes, I do, but I, I rarely talk to people. So yes, this is, uh, this is great. It's very different, but uh, it's going to be a blast nonetheless. Awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, I've been um, starting my new season. So this is season two of my podcast and I've always focused on it being the journey of late bloomer actors and what we can uh, learn for them. But I'm switching it around a little bit and making it more about um, to reflect this, the shows about my journey as a late bloomer actor and bringing in guests that have contributed to my journey uh, in some way, either directly or indirectly, so I can share what I've learned from them. And Jeff, you, you've been a big part of that journey for me, uh, having been introduced to your work initially online, uh, but then more directly back in March of 2017 now, uh, when you agreed to add Adelaide to your Australian tour, um, much right. to my pestering, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> wow. Or even five years, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Time flies, especially when you have a pandemic in the middle of it. That's right. Uh, was yeah, that the first... was about right before the pandemic, when the pandemic hit. That was the year that I was going to be coming back. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but here we are, but I'm finally going to get to make it. But uh, uh, yeah. Uh, was that your first tour, the one that you came down when we met? Have you been to Australia before that? No, no, I'd, I'd, I'd been there. Uh, well, I've been there a total of four times. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah. So uh, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I know the first one though, I think was like in 2000 or wow. something like that. And then there was a big break and then I was doing it like every year. And then I missed that year when the pandemic, but uh, I'll be there in February. So. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that and try to um, uh, get out some dates and everything. So people know what cities you're going to and everything. So, but let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about you first, um, just quickly. So for people that um, don't know a lot about you or might hopefully being introduced to Jeff Seymour for the first time listening to this podcast, could you tell us a bit about your history? How did, how did you get in, into acting specifically and, and how and why did you begin teaching acting uh including the development of your own approach the real life actor well uh let's see uh, i became an actor i came out here when i was uh, to la when i was 19 and i went to a theater school and i uh, was lucky enough to get an agent when i graduated and i started acting in television my first job was in 1979 in October wow. of 1979. So I've been at it for 43 years. Uh, a year after I got out of, well, almost immediately, really, I think it was less than a year, I, I knew that I always wanted to teach. I come from a family of teachers and uh, didn't teach acting, but you know other things. And uh, I, I knew that always interested me. I was also interested in the mechanics of how things work. I'm very fascinated by that. I, I think you may know, David, I'm also fascinated by vintage cars. I restore cars. It's my fever, uh, you know, classic cars and, and mechanics. And I think in another life, I was an engineer or inventor or something. And, and so uh, I, I was always fascinated by process and why we do and what kind of, you know, two of my brothers were very successful sports coaches. So the whole idea of, you know, how it works, but I also, though, I, I was truly in the catbird seat because I, I was an actor at the same time. So I was doing field work the whole time. Now, I know that, you know, many teachers or plenty have been actors and then they became teachers. Um, but what happened with me was I started teaching, you know, a year later and, uh, and I never stopped teaching. So I, I always felt like I was a scientist, you know, in the field all the time. And I was making mental notes. Uh, about everything, about, uh, about what I saw on sets. I, I opened my own theater that I ran for 10 years that I designed and built. I got a building and, you know, gutted it and did that. It was very successful in LA. So I had my own laboratory to use these ideas I had. I was teaching five classes a week there. I mean, I was thoroughly immersed in uh, the idea of, uh, you know, how to make things better. 
Now, I should add here, because I just mentioned that I, I did the theater thing, you see, um, it became paramount that I figured out a way to get actors to do the best possible work in the shortest amount of time, because um, I, I had a house next door. I got this whole property and I lived in the house, so I truly was immersed in theater. Mm. And my theater was 15 feet away. So I was always there and I was, I did everything. And uh, I lived on what those uh, box office tickets were, which meant that I had to get great reviews. The shows had to be well reviewed or I didn't get to eat as well. So it became very important, important to figure out what works. How can I get <clears throat> actors to do work better? How can it be consistent? How can I direct more efficiently? And so many things in that laboratory, teaching five classes a week, being able to direct show after show. I directed all the shows and produced them. Um, I, I, I was able to really develop what I thought worked best. And, and that was many years ago. And here we are now 42 years of teaching. And, 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 and this was the original idea, but I do believe I've gotten a lot better at dispensing it, certainly, if I've learned anything. I mean, the idea is still the same, but I think I've gotten better and more efficient at getting people after 42 years to do it. And, and I, I feel like I'm getting smarter every day. So hopefully that's the case. <laughs> I, I love that because um, the old adage is of uh, those who can't teach, but um, in, in your case, and that's clear cut that you still do and you have acted from the day you've um, uh, walked on stage and started um, teaching as well. So we all know. Yeah, that not only... That's true. I not only acted, but I also, you know, running your own theater and then acting in the shows and directing those. Well, that's a whole, the whole experience, you know. And then, as you know, I, I created uh, with another guy, a comedy series that I sold to a network in Canada and did that for two years. So I, I got to, you know, executive produce my own TV show and I was in total charge. And I wrote all the scripts with my buddy, uh, two seasons, 26 episodes. Um, I'm able to use all these experiences of having sat there and from day one, not just having things happen to me, but having them happen to me. And of course, immediately thinking, what is the lesson here? What did I learn here? What can I tell someone else about this thing and what not to do? Because I just did it. Don't ever do that again. You know, <laughs> I, I become this, uh, you know, this tester. I'm out there constantly in the trenches. So uh, I just did a big show in New York, as you know, a play, and, and uh, um, it, it, it uh, was a big deal. And, uh, you know, doing eight shows a week, uh, I feel blessed to be able to actually be constantly in, you know, artistic combat and, and be able to, to uh, of course, tell actors about that. Now, mm. th this is one thing, though, I, I've heard that... Uh, that phrase my whole life, of course, those who can't do, those who can't teach. But I, I truly believe that I think in, in acting, um, you're better served if the people that are training you have actually been successful. I, I think that's really important. I, I feel like acting and being in the industry is really almost like going into combat. Mm. It's, just, it's just a life of warfare, trying to figure out how to negotiate the coral reefs and get through and not lose your mind. And I think it's more important in this instance, it's more beneficial, it's more accurate. If the person who's giving you information, who is your coach, who's your teacher, has actually been in battle and like a fair amount, mm. it would be like being trained by people who are teaching you how to go and be in combat by teachers who've never ever been in combat. They've never had a live bullet go over their head. They have no idea what this feels like. I, I really, I, I hate to draw such a dark comparison, but after having been gutting it out in the industry for 43 years, you know, it's not war, but it's, it's a battle. It, it is a battle. And, and there's a lot more than like figuring out how to say lines and learning your intentions. There is a ton of stuff that you should be, you should know about. And, and, and a small part of it has to do with acting. Mm. Acting is the hat trick. If it was the hat trick, then anybody who was a decent actor would be working all the time. I mean, you, yeah. you, know, you have to do, oh, you're good. Go ahead, you graduated. Go pick up your money. You're a star, go on. Next, you know, that's not how it occurs. 
it, it's a constant slugfest in mud, you know, trying to things change, uh, what they're looking for, fads. The, the volatility of the business from when I started is so crazy now because there's so much product. There's so many people that want to be, you know, working actors that it's, it's way different than when I started. When I started, you know, in 79, I would look at that like it was a sleepy little town compared to today because there's so many outlets. There's so much going on. Do you, do you so, think that it's, it's changed for the better for actors or is it harder? If you go back and look back at um, back in the eighties and nineties, you know, I'm just going to call it even. I'm going to call it. Well, yeah, listen. Uh, okay, you just said something. When you look back, is it harder? I would say the one difference is that is different. Is in the old days, if you got an agent and the agent believed in you, it wouldn't be uncommon for them to put up with you and work for you and try for you, and you never get nothing for, it, it could be a year and th mm. they would stick with you. They would even tell you. I remember my first agent went on to become a super agent saying to me, um, you know what? It may take 10 years, but we're going to get it done. And, and I remember that, of course, as a kid of 22 or one or 20, whatever it was, I thought 10 years, I'll be dead by then, you know, and you see how fast that flies. But no agent would ever say to anyone, it may take 10 years today. I, I, if they said 10 months, I'd say, boy, you got a really good agent. Because the volatility. It's like they cast you once, they cast you twice. You know, if, you, if people don't start biting, they just kind of cut the fishing line and reach in their tackle box and pull out another. It's become a much more volatile, high speed, quick turnover. And I also think that's been influenced also by our lack of attention spans, how things have quickened, fast, new, noise, show me who, did, you know, it, it's just so quick. It's the so, the, the idea that we used to get eight by tens and sit there and look at them and flip them over and read the resume and then flip them back over, you know? I mean, that's how I used to do it when I cast people. And now it's just thumbnails, people, people, you know? You're looking at teeny pictures, which is another reason why we're told, hey, make sure your picture is mostly your head, because if it's a lot of your body, by the time it goes thumbnail, your head's like this. So, Nothing. you know, new technology, new ways of picking your fruit. It's, uh, it's a different business. But I, I'll say that I think it evens out because there's a ton more product. Mm. No, it's interesting. Interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, you know, what what drew me to your approach initially when I found the the real life actor online and then and got to meet you and do some courses etc with you and been following you for these years yeah. now is is your philosophy on uh, acting being the same as real life hence the the, the title of your your method uh, the real life actor uh, without needing to resort to resort to like a lot of exercise malarkey I think you've called it um, in yes your book. called it many this, things malarkey would be the <laughs> the nicest thing I probably called it. Yes, uh, it, and that's um, what really resonated with me being a late bloomer actor, uh, an actor uh, needing to rely on uh, life experience rather than acting training because I haven't done and can't do the three-year drama school. Uh, can you delve into how and why this has resonated so much for me? Or, uh, why, does it, uh, why does it work for so many actors that, you, um, that train with you? Well, um, first of all, let me preface it by saying one can make an argument that any exercise, anything, stand on your head and, and, and bicycle your feet for two minutes before you do your scene, you know, do push-ups, you balance this egg on the back of your hand. You know, I, I could come up with many things. And I swear to you, I could give you good reasoning why that thing would actually kind of help your acting. I, I could tell you, well, the blood goes to your head, you get up, you get a rush. You feel you know, a little physically whatever, a little looser. You walk over, hit your mark, you feel better. And you'll do it once or twice. And you'll think, yeah, I, I feel better. And then suddenly this will be something we could do. There are tons of things that an actor could do that one could make an argument that probably helps. My philosophy has been, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is the most pertinent, important information, just that, that an actor needs in their head to be able to work, to be able to do the scene, along with knowing the lines. Extra is extra. I know there is this romantic notion that, you know, 
the more work you do, the more stuff you have in your head, the longer your backstory, the more action verbs you've lined up, blah, 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 the, the better the stew you're going to no, And I'm going to tell you why it's really simple. Here's why. Because in real life, where we do our best work, we do our best work in real life. Jeez, I, 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 I work my entire life trying to be as confident and as clear as I am in life when I'm confident and clear. When I'm in my shoes, when I'm at my best in life, you know, the way I feel, the, the, the freedom I have, the, my ability to express myself as fine as Jeff can by just a twist of a word or the inflection that is forever at my fingertips, effortless, and I can be a pretty clever dude. I work my life as an actor trying to get to a point where I can be that free and that clear and that good because that's as good as I can be. I can't be any better than I wish how good I can. But I want to be at least that good, that much freedom, that much confidence. When I'm at my best in life, that's as great as you can be. I know that in life, when I'm having my most magnificent moments, living life, doing stuff, being angry, being very clear about something, making a great argument, being funny, whatever it is I'm doing, when I'm at my zenith in life, when I'm doing my best work, I never have, man, I, not many thoughts at all. I, I, I don't have things in my head. That's how I'm so clever. I mean, I know what I want to talk about, but I have so much freedom. I just am able to express myself on the spot. Just bing, bang, bing. It's so easy. That's, that to me is the brilliance of being kind of an artistic musician. You're able to just riff and play and be great, but you can't if you have a bunch of thoughts in your head. You just can't do it. Hmm. And this comes from know. guys been acting for 83, uh, 43 years, man. I, I've actually been doing it. Okay, so if somebody else tells you that's not the case, well, here's what you can do. Look them up on IMDb, and if they've done more work than I have and more things, then believe them. But if they haven't, at least consider what I'm saying. Because I've been in the trenches, and I've been around lots of actors, and I've paid rapt attention my entire life. I've, I've ta ta paid rapt attention, man. The, the best actors I watched, I figured out what they were doing. I figured out what their thing was. Believe me, I was always wondering, who are these people? Why is he so good? Why is she so good? What does she do right before she acts? How does she get this done? What is her demeanor? And what I express, what I'm talking about is a lifetime of watching that stuff and seeing it over and over and over again to see who are the best people. And also, as we get on as actors and we get to be leads in TV shows and we work a lot, what do we really get better at? Like, aside from a little better at acting. What, what, what do we really do? What is it about our confidence and the way we carry ourselves and how we handle the pressures of the set? How do, what is it that we get better at and why? And I try and analyze that. Well, I don't try. I think I do. And then I share that in the teaching because it's like, look, here's an old saying, start where you want to end up. So if you can walk onto a set because you know kind of how things are already. You don't have to spend 20 years doing it, like how to handle yourself, how to deal with the director, you know, what it's all about, how not to freak out if you screw up, you know, lots of things that have to do with working. If you've really got that in your bones, it's amazing the work you can do on set. And it's amazing how people will treat you because you will seem like a professional and, and like a really, a really good one and not just because you did your acting right. And I get, I know this because a lot of my students will tell me who've like never worked and suddenly they get a big part. They will tell me how people actually mention their professionalism and how impressed they were with the way they handled themselves and just did what the director said. And I said, I know, because I'm telling you, if you do that shit, <laughs> um, everyone notices, everyone. And then it bodes well, and then you get more confident. And that's how you really kind of, snowball into a better professional, but it's a lot more than getting your acting right. Yeah, that's interesting because um, you're sort of saying about ticking all those boxes when you walk on set. Now, I find that when I'm in front of the camera and I'm on set and I'm in the scene and I've got the actors there and everything's happening, that's when my best work comes out. And I'm not proclaiming to be the greatest of actors or anything like that. I'm still on my journey, but I tend to have really good work when I'm in those moments. 
how would you suggest that actors try to attain that when they're doing the cold uh, virility uh, of, of an audition, so to speak? You know, I tend to get in front of that camera in a, in a stark room with a reader, either my wife or someone on Zoom, and it just goes to shit. And I can't get that realism. Um, I, I think you attributed it once to watching an argument of two people on a street, a, a boyfriend, girlfriend fighting. Yeah, I've got many of that. Riveted by it. Yeah, yeah, I'll How tell you. How do we you. get that? Here's a real easy answer. I'm going to give you the easiest answer in the world. And it's the only answer. And it's a truthful answer. And it is the answer. If you make what you're doing in the scene, the point you're trying to make, the lie you're trying to tell, the person you're trying to win back, the person you are firing and for reasons why, if you truly make that more important than your acting, you will never have a problem. In as much as you will always do as good as you can do then. And nothing mm. will keep you from doing that. You can only do what you can do and you who are who you are and you'll make the choices and you're the actor you are. But as far as being able to actually get a lot of wood on the ball every single time, every single time, I don't care if it's on a little fuzzy this, I don't care if it's live and people are there, I don't care what the situation is. If you are able to distill in your mind down to the thing you are actually doing and just accomplish that, it won't matter what you're looking at or who's speaking back to you. And I'll give you a great example. Imagine that you have a major row with someone who, and you're international people, uh, uh, David, and uh, you just found out something that was horrible that your partner did. And at this point, he's on the other side of the world, up in the mountains somewhere, elk hunting, and he is able to get some little device and it's really scratchy, uh, like phone connection. And you're like watching them on your phone. But this is the time because there is something tick tocking away, a business deal in, you know, some other part of the world. And you are pissed off and you want to read him the right act. David, there is no doubt that you would look down at your little phone with an image going in and out, freezing now and there, but you know that he has a good chance he can hear what you're saying. You would focus on this little piece of crap image that was going in and out, and you would pepper this guy with the best work of your life. Why? Because the thing you were telling that guy was more important to you than anything. You don't care if his face is in and out and you can't hear him. You got something to say, and you tell him. You see how that how easy it would be in real life, David? Do you see that? Mm. Right? Do you know what I mean? It would be super easy, David. Even if you couldn't see his face, he only had a headset and he's up at the North Pole because he loves to go dog sledding every year in that big, you know, iterod thing and waste money. You'd be talking to him all scratchy and you could be chewing that guy in your rear end. And it wouldn't matter to you. Now, look at that. We take technology, we scratch it. We have a face that goes in and out. Well, is that any better or worse than when you have to read or, and you have your friends on Zoom or a person standing in the room that happens to be your wife or your neighbor? Um, when you make the commitment to tell somebody something on your mind, certainly as easily as you people do in real life, and you focus on that and only that, that nothing can take you down, man. Because nothing takes me down. I don't give a shit who's watching or what's going on. Sometimes when you got to let somebody know what the deal is, you'd go. Why? Because I decided. Why? Um, because I wanted to, because it's important to me, because I don't need to question it. And who are you to ask me anyway? Shut up. You know, I mean, we are belligerent about the way we will attack stuff in life. But when it comes to acting, we'll do, oh, this is weird. There's like a thing over there and the dog keeps coming in. And, you know, who's blowing their bugle? You know, we just start hearing these things. Yet you could find yourself in real life in that situation and you wouldn't even hear any of that stuff. You'd be so focused on what you were doing. Somebody would interrupt you, go, yeah, hey, Bill, good to see you. As soon as the door closed, rah, you'd be right back at it. Why? Because we wanted to. When the actor's attention is that that's actually what they want to do and they say no i can't help it i said well you could actually because in life you know you don't go to the bathroom in your pants while you're walking down the street hopefully you can control yourself you could control yourself 
don't tell me that you wanted to do that. You don't want to do that in real life. It's not like, oh, focus. I'm mad at David. Focus. Uh, I never do that. I just come in and tell you what's what. That's a lot of power in that, you see. Mm. These are things that actors are never told. They're just told about action verbs and, you know, making strong choices. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome. It's really a lot to take on there because especially since uh, COVID has forced a lot of people into their homes to do their self tapes or zoom meetings and that. So there's lots of training and lots of online ability there to find out how to, to get the technical approach, right. To get your camera set up and everything right. So I find well, I'm finding it myself. I did a podcast on that. I've done a few you podcasts did. on that. Yeah. And I did one recently about, uh, yeah. and how to get the most out of your self tapes. I make it really, 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 really simple. Um, really simple. And it's, it's a pretty good podcast, but you know, my bugaboo is, and it's one of the things I mentioned, is I don't want to see a blue background or a gray background. Like the store-bought one. You know, like I got a little little plastic sheet, whatever that thing is, it's yeah. blue. I don't understand this at all. Somebody started it, and then it just became like a thing. And no one ever questioned it. Why, why blue? What are we going to do, something electronically with the background? We're going to put a Transoys Rex behind you? Why do we need it to be blue? Well, it's a good contrast. Okay, well, a lot of stuff's a good contrast. I'm, I'm right here. Well, you can't see me? I blended into the wall. My head has disappeared in this painting. I mean, now, if we were shooting something, I wouldn't use this painting. But I use this wall all the time. And I have a great big window here. And I let natural light come in. And I sit here. And my idea has always been, I don't want to remind people that they're watching an audition. Do they know they're watching an audition? Of course they do. But I don't want to remind them the entire time it's going on, this is an audition. I think it's way more elegant if the actor can find in their house any wall, don't have a bunch of crap on it. We don't want to be distracted. But if it's just a neutral wall, you can even paint a wall. Just But have it just be a wall. And don't go blue and don't go gray with that little modeling. You know, in the United States, we have Sears, you know, Sears and Roebuck. And I remember in the old days, you go get a picture with your family all looking off like a bunch of dodos, you know, lined up. And there would be that gray modeled background, you know, and you pay $39 and you have a family picture you put up in your rec room. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. I'm I would rather- Right just, now, because I've got my gray background that I use. It's I know a, you do. Blind. <laughs> Every, everyone does. And you see, my, my sleight of hand is, is that I think I'd rather you shoot it in such a clever way, especially if it looks like natural light, like somebody just sat down and then you just did this incredible, like I'm almost watching an independent clip out of an independent film or something, you know? Now, I, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to create a set, nothing. But I like the elegance of not standing on formality with this is my audition. Here is my blue backdrop. My name is Jeff. You know, I just think it's better that you crush the acting in front of a regular wall with just some cool light. And, um, and that's how you win it. You know, I, I've had a lot of success with, uh, my students here by telling them to do that. And I know they also, their managers and agents will remark on how cool it looks. And really it's the simplest thing in the world. I'm like, you know, anti don't work hard. You know, I don't want it to look like you worked hard. That's the thing. It looks like we're begging, we're asking. I want you to look like you're a made actor. You went over and said, here, just turn the thing on. I'll sit over here and just let's do the scene. And you just crush the scene. That's what I want it to feel like when I watch it. But when I see blue, I just think, oh, somebody's trying to get a job. Let's see how they do. I, I mentioned in the podcast, I said, here's an example. If you saw Harrison Ford, the way he looks right now, he's an older man, so you know it's right now. He's a world superhero star. And he was in front and you didn't see the sound, but he was in front of a blue background. You think it was a gag. You think, oh, he must be doing a little stunt. You think you'd see the blue background. You think, well, he's not auditioning. What is this? Is he reading mean tweets? I mean, you'd think what, why is he in front of a blue background? And you would associate it with something like he's trying to get a job or something. You wouldn't think, oh, that there he is. I mean, that's how, so, what we associate when we see those blue backgrounds. That's what we think. I just don't think we should rub that in their face. That's all. Fair enough. And I, I love the idea of, yes, spend some time and money and make sure your technicals are right. But when you come down and you hit that record button, forget about the camera, forget about the lighting. If you start yelling at, in your scene and you come off camera, uh, don't worry, I'm no longer in my position. Just deliver 
the saint and continue well, listen, on. Well, I use mm. my iPhone 13. You know, I, I mean, I have lots of clients that come here. They always sit at the same wall with the same light coming in. I use that and a microphone that clips on them. And that's it. And it always looks great. I go to iMovie. They go to iMovie. For mine, I certainly do a little title. Fade to black, come up so I can control where it starts and where it ends. It looks like it, it looks like nothing. There, it, there's, it's not like there's a lot of production quality like I'm trying to art. You put it together tight, you send it, that's it. But mm -hmm. I like the idea of, that's why I don't think people should overdress. I don't think you should ever do anything that looks like you're trying to art. You know, if you get dressed in a tuxedo, come on. I know we're at your house and maybe you have a tuxedo, but you look silly. Or if you get in total camo gear or something, you know, like a costume. But if you're supposed to be dressed nice and you're a man and you have a jacket on, or if you're a woman, you have a, a, a dress on, that's fine. But if you have an evening gown on, then it's like you're trying too hard. You're playing dress up. We have to think of ourselves as already made actors. That's what I'm saying. Start where you want to end up. You have to tell yourself, look, what would a guy who worked all the time do? How hard would that person work? Would he go and rent a doctor's outfit? No, he would maybe put on a white shirt, roll his sleeves up, look like a, one of those doctors in a hospital who's well-made. And, um, he, but you would, you would do the doctor part brilliantly. In front of a regular wall, you would just crush it. I think, oh my God, look what this guy did like doing nothing. Also, people always say, I wanna look different. I wanna be different. I wanna be different. Well, if you're all in front of blue backdrops, I mean, you're all the then same. you all look the same. You look like he came from the same sausage factory. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, and I've sort of, I've got a question in front of me that I actually didn't ask, but we've just talked about it, but I, I wanted to mention it because chapter one of your book, uh, and this ties everything we've just said, um, you have a statement in there, say, stop acting like an actor and start thinking like a human. And I love that. And I think you, you talk about um, uh, in your book, or, or I'm trying to remember whether you told me directly or probably both, but all the exercise malarkey that people use, you know, what animal am I using or what am I drawing on? What color am I? You used a scene of a, um, an actor that was um, doing a um, rehearsal for a scene of two tribes that were coming together and the other tribe had his son and was going to kill him. And he was sitting at home trying to say, work through yeah. – how am I going to deliver he, how this? How would he react to this? How would he react to that? Yeah, yeah. And I love the way that you said it. You said, well, he's a father. His son's about to be killed. Deliver the lines. Yeah, yeah. You see, uh, as you know, I never, ever talk about acting in any hmm. of my classes and never have. And there's no reason for it because I'll tell you why. No scene has to do with acting. It never has to do with acting. Why would I talk about acting? What does acting have to do with this divorce scene taking place in the bedroom right after they came back from the New Year's Eve party and they're getting undressed out of their fine clothes and now they're having this knockdown, they've had it, this is the night they divorced. What does acting have to do with that? It has nothing to do with that. What is the scene about? Well, I could ask the guy, hey, what's going on? Why are you so angry? I could ask the woman, hey, what's going on? Why are you so angry? What's happening here? What is it, what is it that's wrong? What, would you, what do you want? What do you want? You know, as we would in life, the exact same way if I could be a referee, if I could somehow come in like some kind of therapist and the person would answer me directly and honestly, you would tell me what you're up to and you would tell me what you're up to. That's how I believe uh, we should do it. Because now we're not saying, hey, here's a bunch of acting stuff. Now forget all that and just do the scene of that old saw. We're only talking about the stuff that you need to remember. Not the stuff that you're supposed to forget, because what if you don't remember to forget? You see, then you're just an actor in your head. So I don't give you stuff I don't want you to think about. I, I, I try and program the actors about as close to the way we program ourselves. Like, I, I you know, because I've been doing this my whole life. I told you, I, I've been in the trenches. I've always thought about it. I would be in arguments. I would be doing things and I would find myself thinking, wow, and this is interesting. This is how I do it. huh?" And I'd make a mental note because I think, wow, you know, people think you do it another way. Like, for instance, uh, as I've gotten older, I've had a number of people die. My mother, my father, my brother, my nephew. And um, I've been given the news or I was there. And one thing I realized is that when people get the news, no one ever cries. 
I look around the room. As soon as they get the news, no one goes, what? <laughs> they don't do it. Everyone sits around like trying to even fathom what that means. And we, what? Why? I mean, how? When? And we just kind of look at each other. And, you know. and then, you know, four days later, I'm doing something obscure. And then suddenly somebody asks me a question. I mention my father and I break down and blubber. I think that that's how life works. That life is different, you know. It's not the way most actors think they want they should do it. We rarely think about real life. We plan things. We 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 think, oh yeah, this is how it would go, and then I'll do it this way. And and it, most actors won't cop to that. They won't tell you that's what they do, but that's what they do. They sit at home and they go over their lines and they keep trying to say their lines in a way that makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? And you're trying to get them right, so you do them over and over and over and over again because you want to learn them and you want to be a dutiful actor. And every time you do it, you give it shape, you give it a sound, you experiment a little in your house with your cat, maybe with the refrigerator. And then you say it one way and you go, oh, and it kind of informs you and you go, oh, yeah, that's what I mean, I guess, you know, and that's that's kind of cool. But then what the most actors do is they remember what they did with their refrigerator and they go to the set and they think, well, I'll do it that way. Because when I said it in my kitchen, it sounded really cool. Now, you know, they're not overthinking it that way, but that's what they end up doing. They end up bringing to the set the thing that they rehearsed and, and kind of locked it down a little bit, you see. And I think that's the death of any good acting. It's another thing of don't plan stuff. Don't think about too much stuff. Know your lines. Honestly understand as in life what your beef is and start talking. And let's see what happens. Now, I know I've done this my whole life with actors and I know it works. But don't talk about acting. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to do deep knee bends or yoga or whatever, sure, sure. All that stuff, I guess, you know, makes you feel better. Go do it. But if you tell yourself, if I don't do this, I can't act, then you're giving your power away. And some actors do that. Oh, I need to do this first. I need to do that. I have to write all this down. I must do this thing, you know, or I can't act. And, and that takes away a lot of power. And not only that, but then if something goes wrong, they think, oh, I didn't do enough of this. And then they go and they keep doing it. And that's not where the problems are. Hmm. Uh, the problems I, are something once... you... What? Go ahead. Sorry. I once said um, uh, online, uh, I mentioned how the word objectives and they say actors, what's your objectives here? And I know you don't like that word and you don't use it. And someone said to me, oh, please don't take my objectives away. That's all I've got. But um, is that still a little bit there? Because you were mentioning before. No, you're going no, to the scene. objectives are there. But I, I, I really, in my refined way of working with actors, I try not to use those kind of uh, blunt object words, you know, to me, objective isn't something I ask a friend in life. I wouldn't, you know, if you were talking to some guy and you were like talking about business and, and, or you were having a discussion with a woman, let's say, and the woman went to the bathroom. I wouldn't walk over to you and I wouldn't say to you, Hey, what's your objective here, David? Cause see, that's smacks of acting. That's smacks of, uh, planning. I'd say something like, uh, you know, what are you upset about? What do you want? Why are you talking to her? What is it you're trying to get out of her? What are you trying to get out of this moment? What, what, why, why are you talking about that stuff? Is this something you want? I would say it that way because that feels more like life. But objective, uh, it's too stark a word. It, it, makes it makes me feel like it's kind of acting manipulative as opposed to what we say with people. Why do you keep talking to her, man? I'm basically saying, what's your objective? I said, if you hate it, if you hate your neighbor so much, how come you go there every day? What's that about? I'm actually saying, what's your objective? But that's how I talk to actors. I'd rather it do that way. Because I find that then the way they pursue that, it comes out a lot more organically and, and kind of a, in a more nuanced way, let's say, with more finesse. Then when you use the word objective, you know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, and there's this thing, you know, and, and I, I find that the, the, um, the finesse of the way they do lines becomes a little more blunt because they're thinking about an objective, you know, as opposed to life, which uh, I don't think we think that way. So part of the real life actor thing is I try to use words I'd use in life if I were asking a friend what was up. You know, it'd be like that. You know, we say like choices. Yeah, we make choices. 
I'd say, well, how are you going to fire the guy? Well, the guy makes a choice. And how is it? He's really sweet to the guy. He's very nice. He gives him a big package. He says, look, you've been great. He gives him a letter of recommendation. I made a choice to be nice to the guy. You know, he's a good guy. I wanted to know it's okay. Was you, I told him, get off the premises or I'm going to call the cops. I'm tired of his shit, blah, blah, blah. What was my choice? I was blunt. That was my choice. I don't like to say choice, though. I like to Fair say, enough. how would you do that? But that's what we're talking about. So it's about not putting the acting terminology on it. So actors yeah. don't end up in their head, in their head, so to speak. Yes. And listen, panicking. listen, you, you got to keep actors out of their head. That's the thing. You got to keep them out of their head. Just going back to your book a little bit um, in Chapter 24, you talk about the differences between stage acting and film acting uh, and that there's really no difference. A lot of people say that uh, the best actors are the ones that have come up with a stage background because they've it's a different acting and then they can bring it to film. But uh, can you elaborate a little on that? Because that's something that goes, uh, as I said, goes different to yes, the acting I, world. Yes, I've had so much stage experience and, uh, mm. you know, I just... It's a love of yours, you. isn't it, stage? You oh, love yeah. the stage. Mm. Oh, my God, I... I mean, my dream was actually to work the theater that I just worked at. You know, I thought, well, that's never going to happen. I mean, how, I'm not even near New York. It's a closed community. Nobody gets in from the outside. My very successful actor friends who are in all the big movies, they love theater. They can't even get auditions, you know. It's like it's so closed. And then somehow I got in and did this show, <laughs> which is just one of those miracle stories. But um I can tell you from working there and being able to do all the work I've done that, no, there is no difference at all. I'll make this short. Um, you just acclimate whatever you're doing to the size of the space. If you're in extreme close up, you have to think in terms of smaller because the camera's here and the mic is right here. And that's what that's about. And if you're in a 3000 seat house, then the people in the back row, have to hear me. Now that should not take away from my reality. And here's a simple reason. David, I could put you up there at the back row. You and I could be in the theater in the middle of the day. And I could say, Hey, David, can you hear me? And you'd say, yeah, I can hear you. And I'd get a sense of how loud that was. And then let's say uh, you asked me to tell you that story, like where I grew up and I started telling you just because I needed you to hear me in the back row. Am I suddenly phony? Why would I be phony? I mean, what, wouldn't it be better for me to tell it truthfully because, or like real, because you would understand it better. Why, why would I do anything with that? Now, do you need to speak up? Do you need to have other qualities? Do you need to understand like working live and people laughing and feeling an audience? Uh, there's a ton of stuff like that. That is so important. A simple one is it blows my mind. <laughs> How many professional actors will actually keep talking after the audience starts laughing their ass off? I mean, I have sat on stage and looked at professional actors and thought, are you deaf? Do you not <laughs> hear the laughter? You're supposed to be quiet now. I mean, you know, so there are things you have to know. Now, why is a theater actor perhaps I don't know if it's necessarily true, but I can understand where this sentiment comes from. Perhaps more uh, capable, let's say, on many different levels when they move over to uh, film or television. I would say because I think at the end of the day, the well-trained actor who understands how they use their body, who have had to move across stages continuous with people watching, no cutaways, no cut. You don't flub lines. If you do, you got to make it work. Understanding humor and drama because you felt the heartbeat of the audience, you know, which you never feel when you work on a soundstage. I think those things maybe gift certain actors to where then when they work on a set, they're just, they feel super capable. Super capable. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're a great stage actor, <laughs> working on a set is like, it's too easy compared to that. I did eight shows a week. The show was three hours long. I mean, wow. it, 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 I couldn't believe it. I mean, we'd do one of those shows and then I'd sit there and I think, we got to do another one today. And, you know, you just think, <laughs> wow, I feel like I'm some kind of crazy boot camp place, you know. I love it. So, and, and you're... You're revisiting that role, I believe. You said you've uh, been asked to revisit. Yes, the I've been asked by a 
artistic director and director of a theater in Montreal, a big theater up there. She had actually seen the show in New York and then called my agent and offered me and said, would you play the same, same part? And it's so funny because she was introducing me. She actually let me in. I asked to be in on the casting process. I didn't want to be too snooty, but after having worked in New York, I, I wanted to know what I was getting into if I was going to do a three hour show again and, and play the again. part I was playing. And they were only too gracious. They said, absolutely. <clears throat> so they would introduce me as, and this is Jeff Seymour. He originated the role in New York. Up, and I thought, wow, wow, I did originate a role. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I actually did. Which, uh, of course, would also be a dream for me growing up loving theater to think that you would open up in the future, uh, you know, the playbook and it would say original cast. And I would be the cat that that did it first. You know, I've read those my whole life. In the beginning of the thing, you see the names of the people. And I thought, wow. So at least I, I got one of those before I died. That, and that's great. I think and it's it's certainly well deserved. I know you've you've said um that you don't like to say, oh, I'm Jeff Seymour, the real life actor, and I've trained so and so and so and so and so and so. Yeah. That's you don't have that, but I, I think you deserve that a, a little bit too, that recognition, especially you know, just that play. So, uh, what's your thoughts? I, I, I don't I, I, listen. I, I'm not saying I don't deserve recognition. Um, the you reason do. why yeah. I never talk about the people that I've taught is because. Uh, there are a number of things there. One, I don't feel good taking credit. I, I know how hard it is actually to be an actor. And okay, f first of all, a number of things. Most of the people that have gone on and, and be done very well that I've worked with over these 42 years, I swear to you, when they came into my shop uh, from day one, I watched them work and I thought, yeah, this kid's all right. He's got a fast pitch. This this lady, this lady knows how to, you know, hit the ball. I mean, it was just it, it, it didn't surprise me when they went on and did very well. OK, now, what did I do? Well, I like to think that I maybe greased up the flight path a little for them. I uh, I kept them from thinking nonsense. Uh, some of them came to me and I said, OK, you're right. All your instincts wanting not to do all that shit you've been taught. You're absolutely right. Don't do that anymore. And, you know. I, I don't feel good about that. I, I think it's a, you know, um, I, I just, I don't want to take credit, but, but the main reason is that's just the personal reason. The main reason is I don't want uh, actors to come to me like they go to these other gurus, some of which come to your uh, continent um, because they go, Oh my God, he taught so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so, and he taught so-and-so and so-and-so. -so. I want to go there. And, and maybe nothing makes sense and it doesn't work for you, but you think somehow magic will touch you. I don't want actors to come to me for that reason. I want them to come to me because they, they, they've listened to a podcast. They like what I've say. It, it aligns with who they are and what they want, or they've read my book and it aligns with some thinking that they have. And then when they come to me, they're just right for my dojo because the other people before I had my podcast, for instance, I would get these people to come in with those other thoughts. And then it would be like, you know, they want to tell me about like why. And I'm saying, get out of here. I don't, I'm not interested in having an argument with you about what well, is my dojo. If you want to work out of here, we do it this way. And so it has helped me that way. I feel if I start doing that stuff, um, I, 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 I just don't want to do it. I want to do it because people hear what I have to say and they like it and they want to come and study with me. I, I, I don't need the, uh, I, and I can't claim credit, man. It's just, it feels, uh, cause I know how hard it is <laughs> to just mm. remain standing, you know, <laughs> when I hear these actors and they've been in it for five years or something and you know, they're full of piss and vinegar, as you say, I go, that's great, man. I hope it lasts, but you know, talk to me after 25 years. I know that most of the people I went to school with, a lot of which were very talented, a lot of them were very talented. They just couldn't last, man. Life is hard. You have kids, you gotta, how do you make money? I mean, <laughs> it's. It is, um, it's a tough sport. It yeah. is. And a lot of people say that about acting that you've, it is really, really tough. So um, sometimes I look at my career where I'm at that um, I've had it, uh, it's uh, difficult for me because I haven't done acting as a young person. But then on this flip side of that, maybe I'm going to have it easier because I've started late and I'm coming into retirement. So I'll have a 
income stream and I'll be able to focus on it completely. And, and I reckon I was one of those actors that came to you. I came to you because you resonated with me and, um, and, and I've certainly improved over time with you. I think you said it once on a Zoom meeting, you said, geez, Clarky, you've really, really improved. Yes. So that's great. And I actually meant that. <laughs> I hope you do. Hey, listen, I'll tell you the same thing. And for all the older cats out there that are listening, I was just talking to my agent who forever is so kind and supportive, you know, and I just, it amazes me how, how much he believes in me. It's so crazy, you know, because I'm getting on, right? And you think, well, uh, and I've had some heyday. I've had some good times and, and I'm working and, but, you know, I'm looking for another heyday. And, um, and I said, um, you know, ours is going to be a better story. Mine's going to be a better story because it'll show you that, you know, if, if, if you older cats just keep at it, you keep loving what you're doing and you keep improving, you keep improving your skills that it ain't over till it's over. So you can think the same way because, you know, uh, there's a lot of heroes for the younger people because people are working when they're younger all the time. Mm. But as we get older, we think about the person you hear about, you go, you know, that lady didn't even, no one even knew who she was until she was 50. And they'll get her now. She just won an Oscar. You know, you hear those things and you think like, well, it's not impossible, you know? I mean, we, we, we herald those actors that weren't discovered until they were older. I think, yeah, I'll be one of those. That's cool. I, don't, I wouldn't mind being one of those. One of those. And so the Jeff Seymour never, the Jeff Seymour will, will um, never retire then? Well, you know, I do love working <laughs> on old cars, but I adore doing what I'm doing and I don't ever feel like I'm working. Certainly not when I'm acting and not when I'm teaching. I love it. So, and it's, 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 it's like, you know, the easiest thing in the world in a sense, you know, it's like what I feel most comfortable with. And, and it's not like I have to go and box people or, or run or do something that I physically I can't do, you know, <laughs> well, I've still so got at least I've... a few months uh, left before I start uh, slowing down few months oh no um, <laughs> i was joking one, there that's good that's good i've got a a big question here just before we start to wind up and um it's going towards your uh, a recent episode on your podcast the episode's called uh, many reasons why you should be word perfect yeah. uh this this really touched on a point i often discuss which is the memorization of lines uh, can you discuss your thoughts on how best to commit scripts to memory so that an actor can make it seem like it's being spoken for that first time why is it why is it so important for the to, for the actor to to honor the writer's words well uh, the short answer is because those are the writer's words that's the deal i mean uh, let, let's just start with the actors saying what's going to set me apart what's going to make me indispensable what's going to make them want to hire me over and over again well here's one thing be the actor who says the lines verbatim. Now, do we hire actors who don't say the lines verbatim? Yeah, we do. We do. But as I say in the podcast, I've sat there many times, and some of the times um, on my show it was my script, and I'd hear them messing with the words. And I think, wow, and I'm sitting right here. And you don't. Now, you can tell the difference between someone who fudges a word because they're nervous and they say it, and then other people start adding shit. You know, I, 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 I've never been impressed with that, ever. In fact, I found it insulting. Like, yeah. You know, if you want to do that, why don't you just go create your own show and then you can say whatever you like. But if I'm going to pay you, you're going to say my words. That's just, that just seems simple to me. Again, mm -hmm. you come in, you get nervous, you say a bunch of other shit because you just forgot what you were doing for a second. We can tell when that's happening. And believe me, we can tell when people are lazy we can tell when people have taken the idea of the line and I can tell the difference be between they just memorized it that way. They think that's easier for them to say. They think that sounds more clever or they just screwed up because they're nervous. We can generally tell. Mm -hmm. And we are never impressed with people who make shit up. It makes me nervous. So let's make it simple. Would we hire that person? Yeah, sure. If they were the absolute best person, without a doubt. But if there was someone else who was also great and they said every line perfectly, oh, there's, there's never a question. I'll take that one. Why? I don't want any problems. And you know what? 
we can't do this thing where we're filming and then you keep screwing up the lines and then the lady or the guy has to walk out and tell you what the line is and they have to walk back. And then we go, I don't want to do that, man. I don't want to do that. And I don't even know who you are and you've only worked a little bit and now I'm giving you a job and you came in here, you didn't say all my lines or you're going to say them on the set because you know you need to. We just don't go, oh, well, that's fine. If he gets close, just keep the cameras rolling. That's not how it works. No, no writer that has any self-esteem. We go, okay, fine. Just it's close. Just let's get home today. Nobody thinks this way. Every writer thinks that their stuff is the best. So first of all, that's why you have to do it. It sets you apart. It makes you seem like a professional. Even if you think the script is, is, is terrible, you might be wrong. So let's just make it even. We do the lines the way they're written. Okay. Now, how do you, how do you do that? How do you get it that way? Sometimes it's easy. I'm sure you've done it. David, I'm sure you've tried to memorize some things and you find the words come a little easier. And then other things, it's like impossible. And you wonder, what is the difference? It's not necessarily the difference between good writing and bad writing. Sometimes people write in a way that just flows with the way David sees the world. And other times they write in a way and it's not how David sees things. And it becomes very cumbersome. But the bottom line is, that's what you signed on for. Figure it out, young man. Get your lines down. I mean, I got all sorts of podcasts that talk about it. Exercises to do, tricks, my gist exercise, um, the, the thing where we use playing cards. I mean, I got a lot of great exercise about really understanding what you're talking about and a lot of philosophy about it. But all of that is to say, figure it out. You do your best. And if your best is whatever you got and you really worked hard and you really tried and now you've got to film it and send it in because it's time, that's the best you could do, man. No shame mm -hmm. in that. You try. You did it. Let's see what happens. Your, you aspiration, your aspiration, though, has to be ultimately be word perfect. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned a lot in, the, in that memorization of lines, no matter how you do it, don't memorize it in a way of how you think you're going to deliver it learn the lines and i think oh yes you asked that question as well yeah mm. um there are a lot of tricks to that i have all the time and in, in the people i'm training there's always someone who's really stuck in that so i tell them look do not keep doing it the same way each time you're practicing it think about what you're saying make sure you're speaking through your line slow it down speed it up say it with a silly accent lay on your back run your lines on your back with a friend of yours that's walking around the room. You just keep doing it different ways so that the end result is you do memorize it, but you do not fall in love with the way you say it because you will then try to just do that and it'll always be a little faky. You have to get to a point where you can just let it roll when they say action and trust like in life It'll come out right. It'll come out the way it needs to if you just get out of your own way. This is a very tricky part. This part, actors have a hard time just letting their fingers go and relaxing and letting it, just trying that. And of course, I encourage that in all my classes all the time. I'd rather have you do that. I'll tell people, look, I want next time you see, I want you to do some of that stuff differently. To force yourself to say the line differently. Pause a little longer. Say it quickly. You force yourself. I know that sounds like a a very external kind of exercise. But what it does is it forces the actor to say it differently. And lo and behold, when they did, it made perfect sense. And then a bunch of lines after that are changed now because they've kind of caught the wave of allowing themselves to just start speaking. Once you get to the point where you understand this, you can do this well, it never becomes a problem again. You'll never have this thing. I can tell you that when I was doing the New York show and I did 86 of those performances, um, Every night I would just hit delete in my mind. Even if I had some incredible moment, I, don't, don't, don't think you're gonna repeat it, Jeff. If it happens tomorrow night, great, but you know what, something else will happen. Don't try to repeat your shit because it always is a little phony. So I would just delete, I didn't care. And I would just go back the next night and just start A, B, C, D, E, F, I'd go through the show, I wouldn't care. Next night, that that was my mantra. That's what I did, you know, and I, and I think I, I benefited from that because all this stuff's tricky. But once you figure it out, it, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's just what you do and you won't be a problem. Getting there is a little slippery. 
a slow process, but you get there eventually. And I love that idea of, I know I had that in my head and I haven't been doing it uh, recently, you know, learning the lines fast and slow and lying on your back and with a silly accent. So it's certainly something I need to bring back into my work and, and hopefully see some improvement in front of the camera. Uh, especially for my audition. So. Yeah, you will. Because, you know, even saying it in a silly accent or going, I don't think that you, you keep trying to actually speak through your words. And what you end up reinforcing in yourself is, I could say this so many different ways and still make sense. So then you don't feel as beholden to one way because you've said, I've done it a bunch of ways. And I, it sound, I, I know how to speak. Look, I'll do it this way. I'll do it while I'm eating. And you realize, and so the point of that exercise is you get to a point where you feel like, I could do this anyway. Let's just go ahead, start talking. Let me just see what happens, you know. And that's where you want to get. Love it. All right. And I'm mindful of the time, Jeff. I just want to ask one quick question before I ask uh, my final question and then talk about your book and podcast and you coming to Australia quickly. But <laughs> um, brand, they talk a lot about branding practice. Um, what's your brand or what character type do you play? What's your thoughts there? Can actors especially when you talk real world, um, that actors can just go in there. Well, if you're the father, or you're the doctor, does that mean we can just play anything and just put yourself in that person's shoes and, and act it? Or do you think you do? Have uh, I don't branding? think we put ourselves in that person's shoes as much as we find that person in ourself. I think this is my latest. I want to keep telling people this. I think it works a little better. You find that person, you find that slice of that thinking in yourself. Because otherwise we go and we try and be something we're not. We, we're just trying to, we got an idea of how a doctor might be. I know I'm a doctor. I'm the doctor. I'm the doctor. And I'm the doctor who doesn't have a lot of patience. Meaning I can't, I don't like to talk to people long and I don't look at them in the face when I speak to them. And, and I just find that in myself, you see. That's, but um, your, your question there was uh, uh, branding. Branding. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, Well, when I'm working with actors and I see them do something that I, a, a, a character in a certain type of scene, maybe it's a rom-com, maybe it's where the woman is playing super crazy or the guy's very malevolent or there's something, this scene and that character, I know there are times I'll watch an actor do something and I'll say to them, this kind of thing is in your wheelhouse. You should know that. Meaning... In my travels of watching things and people and acting and, and sitting in over 10,000 auditions, what you just did in that genre, in that scene is incredibly authentic to me. And it comes to you kind of naturally and you look right, your hair and your face. It, it's like you're easily cast in that and you'd look really good when you did it. A lot of times what happens, how people become stars or get on in their lives is all of the planets align and you're given this part that is just so in your wheelhouse. It's so up your alley and you can't even guess like you're a nice guy, David, but then we give you this part that is so creepy and weird. And for whatever reason, David, when you do the lines and you look at the people, it's like, oh man, that is the weird guy next door. And it, 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 nobody would ever think that would be David. And then people see you do it and that now you're working all the time and Unfortunately, it's going to be a lot of parts like that for a while because that's what everyone's going to suddenly want because you blew their mind. But that can happen because you know it's in your wheelhouse, you see. I'll talk to a lot of actors. I'll say, well, what do you see yourself doing? I want to be the new, you know, Asian Superman. Or they'll say some crazy thing, which, okay, <laughs> great. You know, Mazel Tov, that's a good aspiration. But seriously, man, I mean, you're a little teeny guy and you don't have the body for it. So <laughs> what, what are we talking about here? You know, being realistic with the way you look, and what is your strength? It can take you a long time to understand it. If you have someone that can recognize it in you and tell you, that's good. But I know the big successful moments I've had in my life, just like even the New York thing, why I even got the role, was because it was just perfect for me. It was, it was right in my wheelhouse. And as a result, I got to break into that place because I was the man they wanted. And it wasn't hard what I did, you know, when I did it, it felt like easy for me, you know? So it was like, it was just the perfect kind of thing, perfect kind of emotionalism, you know, and that's what it was, uh, you know, and the, but then people see it go, Oh, wow. You, you seem like, you know what you're doing. And I'm thinking, well, that's cause you, you tossed me a slow pitch for what I, what I hit, you know, and that's how that, that's how it works. So 
branding in the sense of, of maybe really trying to be honest and understanding what your strengths are, you know, and not worrying about trying to be things that, you know, just really trying to get working. Like, how am I going to get working? What, what is it I can do to start working? And then once you're working, understanding what is plausible in the world of the types of roles you could play, even if you had to do some convincing, that'd be okay. But then when you did it, people would go, oh, I see why you convinced us, you know. Being realistic, these, these things are important because it is a volatile industry and, and you get like one chance. One chance up the bat, if you know, in the main stadium and you're gonna wanna get some wood on the ball. Thank you, that's fantastic. Awesome, well, Jeff, um, we probably answered the question all up, but if it's, this will be more like a summary, I guess. Uh, what, what three things would you consider to be pivotal for an actor to be in becoming a successful actor or improving in their career of acting? Okay, yeah, uh, very easy, uh, three things. Um, well, th the business of being able to persevere is so huge that one thing I'm always telling actors when they want to get started and, 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 and they're sure they're in love and you're in love with the business until you're not. There's no shame when you realize one day, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, good. It's your life. You're living it. Enjoy the ride. Go do something else. If you can not act, flee. But if you're committed to it because you love it, because it means so much to you, because you love entertaining, because you love, you have empathy and the whole idea of being a storyteller, being parts of stories is something that's just so, you love movies and television, this is your jam. Then um, best thing you can do is get ready for the long haul, not a sprint. And the number one thing I would tell any actor is figure out a way to achieve neutral buoyancy in life to where you're making enough money somehow to where you can pr pursue being an actor. So some kind of job where you can get away if you need to, you're, but you're making enough money to where you in your mind are comfortable, not deprived, not always under, you know, this thing of losing everything. If you can live modestly and you just need a modest amount of food and a modest amount of activities, and that will bring you peace. Because the important thing is you have to be peaceful. You have to be happy because we can see it in auditions. We can see it in actors. You're not as shiny. You look beat. We want winning racehorses. So you need to find a way to figure out your life to where your basic life, where you live, the people you hang out with, it's good. You feel good because you're going to need this. So you've got a job. You, you've got neutral buoyancy. You don't need to be going up, but you're certainly not going down. You're able to maintain a lifestyle and it's okay. Life is good. That is the number one first thing you have to do. The second thing is, um, and I'm not saying this because I'm a teacher, uh, but you should be in the dojo weekly. You should be doing, you should be doing some kind of, you need to get better. I mean, I am constantly thinking, how can I, am I improving? Let me do this. I'm constantly thinking about acting. Thank God I get to work with actors and I'm, I'm going over it. And I can't wait to revisit this play that I just did because I feel smarter now. And because when your day comes and they call you out onto the field in the Coliseum and they let the tiger loose and you're the gladiator, you know, you've got to be able to do your best. Because this is your shot. And this is where it, things have changed. These days you get like a shot and they'll watch you. And if you just kind of punk out, you don't do anything. They don't think in two years, oh, let's see Jeff again. I bet you he's gotten better. No, there's a billion people in line. They don't have time to see Jeff again. The lion ate him. It's over. So that's very important is you keep practicing. And um, uh Above all, above all, I think you have to, along with that neutral buoyancy, is figure out a way to find bliss in your life, to, 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 to have a certain positivity, man. Because I know when you have positivity and you've got food in your belly and you can keep the lights on, man, you, you make better choices, you don't get desperate, you, better things come to you. Uh, you're able to just be this thing person that we are attracted to, because I know I'm attracted to those people intuitively more than I am the ramshackle beat up person. I'm more attracted to this person who seems to have life figured out. You're okay. You seem happy. What's with you? I want to talk to you. 
that attraction, it, 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 we see it, we can feel it. We know when we've got people that don't necessarily need us desperately. We want to be that person's friend, not the person who's licking our boots and, and desperate. Uh, no, I know it's sad. <laughs> Here's some money. Go get some food. But no, we want these winners. So whatever you can do to get yourself in that space and find some simple peace in your life and be able to put food in your belly and keep your lights on and keep hitting the bag, keep hitting the bag, keep hitting the bag, keep uh, admitting there's more to learn, you know, watching movies and you just immerse yourself in the world and be positive. That's it. That's the best you got. And no guarantees even then. Love it. That is a fantastic way to, to end the podcast. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. That is just an awesome insight into your approach and, and acting in general. And it's a reason why I follow you and, and love working with you. So thank you. Pleasure. Now can I getting, ask, you know, obviously, uh, talk about this stuff all the time so talking about it's yeah. really easy easy yeah. and you love it you clearly love it and that's what's fantastic and uh, now actors they can um, jump on amazon and they can get hold of your book the real life actor which i have my uh, very own copy of course both digitally and the hard copy so they can uh, get that on amazon um can't they nice and easy mm -hmm. and where else can they find you online if they wish to reach out well uh, real life actor um, uh, the real life actor.com. Certainly there's a lot of stuff there. And then the real life actor podcasts. I just uh, did the 154th yes. uh, podcast and I'm currently rated number one in, uh, in the performing arts category, apparently uh, these past few weeks, I never go below two, but I guess that's because uh, I have so many in my library now that even if I haven't, you know, there'd be some space in there sometimes, but now I'm doing them weekly. So, um, you know, people are seeing them around the world, listening to them around the world. I'm just thrilled to death that I get people yes, from great. Bahrain to Hawaii to, you know, Chile. And it, it's, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's such a great thing. I love it. And thank you for doing them. They are fantastic. I listen to them religiously and I have um, all my podcasts queued up. Now I'm a bit behind, but as soon as yours comes out, I go straight to it and listen to it within hours of it being released. So uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank Jeff, you. thank you very much for being on the podcast. Anything you'd like to say to all my listeners before we go, Jeff? No, just keep on keeping on, guys. Just keep on keeping on. Just keep doing it. There you go. Love your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.